Hi, I'm James Hamilton from Stumping Up's Woodworking Journal, and today we're going to talk about how to buy and turn rough sawn lumber into project parts most efficiently. Most new woodworkers take a board and they cut out as many project parts as they can from it with as little waste as possible. So if you need four parts that are each two feet long, you might buy an eight foot board and cut it into four pieces. This may be an effective strategy when you buy lumber that's already surfaced in thickness down to your three quarters of an inch thick. But when you get tired of that poor quality pine that you get from the home center or the overpriced hardwood that they wrap up in the cellophane and you want to graduate into buying rough lumber, everything changes. So let's take a minute to talk about how I buy rough lumber and then I'll take you outside the shop and show you my process for laying out project parts on the boards so I can use them most efficiently while still getting the right wood for each project part. MyWoodcutters.com is the sort of small business I like to support. Stefan is a great guy and he can find you knives and cutters for almost any joiner, planer, shaper, or molding machine. And his are the best prices if you're planning to upgrade to a helical carbide cutter head. Please use the link below this video to check with him before you buy somewhere else. Some small businesses are just worth supporting. First, how much lumber should you buy? There are two ways to buy rough sawn lumber for a project. The simplest way is to just add up how many board feet you need and go buy it. But this is fraught with danger. Let's say after adding everything up, I know I need 100 board feet of lumber. Can I just go buy 100 board feet and get to work? No, because I have to account for waste. And I'm not just talking about the occasional knot. Let's say you buy a bunch of 6 or 7 inch wide boards and you need to get a bunch of 4 inch wide parts out of them. You can't put two 4 inch parts side by side on a 7 inch wide board. So you're going to have a lot of waste. Fortunately, most projects are made from a variety of part sizes, and you may be able to use those narrow strips that are left over elsewhere in the project. But you may not. So take that into consideration. You may be better buying a variety of board widths to accommodate all of your project parts more efficiently. Wood is also wasted when you joint and plane it straight and flat. Hopefully your lumber dealer didn't try to sell you a bunch of banana-shaped boards, but especially if you have very long project parts, you want to be sure you get the straightest boards possible for those. That way you don't have to mill them paper thin to take out that bow or twist. The same goes with extra wide project parts because those might be eaten up when you try to take out a big cup in a board. You may be better off buying thicker wood for big parts like that, like five quarter or six quarter, so you have some extra room to work with during the milling process. And don't forget the grain. If you want a particular look, such as nice straight grain on certain parts, you may have to waste a lot of material that has grain that just won't work for you. Buying wood by the board foot can be wasteful, but it may be your only option if you buy online. It may also be a way to get a better price since some dealers charge a premium for hand-picked boards. If you go this way, plan on at least 15 to 20 percent waste for most projects and as much as 40 to 50 percent waste if you plan to be really picky about grain and color. Of course, it's not really all waste. You're likely to use most of those leftovers in smaller projects down the road, but it can add up in the short term. That's why it's best, if you can, to buy your boards individually rather than by the board foot. So I'm talking about going to the lumber yard and actually laying some boards out on the floor and then taking a lumber crayon or some chalk and drawing each individual project part on the boards themselves. That way you can be sure that you're getting exactly what you want. Many dealers will let you do this if you're respectful of them and their customers. That means not getting in their way and neatly stacking your boards back in the pile if you don't take them. You should still plan on buying a little extra in case you mess a part or two up during the build. We all do that. And if you're working on a large project that will require a lot of wood, some dealers might charge a premium for extracting all the best boards from their stack and leaving them with just culls. I once got charged an extra 40% for the right to select my own boards. It cost me several hundred dollars extra. I recommend asking first so you're not surprised when it comes time to pay. Many times though, we buy wood without a specific project in mind. For example, I got a good deal on a bunch of hickory a few years back. I just bought what they had. I didn't have a project in mind, but now I want to turn it into some furniture. Since I bought it as a single lot rather than individual boards, I have a mix of lengths and widths and qualities, and now I have to find the most efficient way to use each board, or else I might not have enough for my project. 
So let's go outside and I'll give you some real world tips on how to turn rough lumber into project parts. I made myself a materials list with the dimensions of each project part. I'm going to physically lay out each part on individual boards and then mark them off the list as I go. My first concern is the condition of the boards. These are about an inch thick now and I'll be milling them down to three quarter. So a little bit of a bow or a cup won't matter a great deal. If I have a banana like this board, I'll have to be sure to only take short project parts from it. A short segment of an arc can be flattened easily with minimal waste. But if I try to get a long part from a heavily bowed board, I'll have to mill it way too thin to flatten it out. Fortunately, most of these boards are relatively flat. I'm starting with the widest project parts. These will be for the top of a bathroom vanity, which will be glued up for more than one piece. So I want to make sure I have the widest, clearest boards for this. I'm only laying out the rough measurements for each piece. In fact, I'm adding an inch to their length so I can rough cut them, then mill them flat, and finally trim them to their final length later. It's better to have parts that are a little bit too long than too short. I also label the project parts as I go. This is vanity part Q. Of course, I have to work around any flaws in the boards. This means checking both sides. A split may look relatively minor on one side, but the other side shows it's more severe than I thought. Here I see only very minor checks on the end of the board, but on the other side I can see they extend much deeper into the end grain than I thought, so I'm going to have to trim more from the end to get rid of them. Nothing causes waste like a knot in the wrong place. If I have to cut around this one, it may make my board about an inch too short for the last project part I wanted to get out of it. I could try to get a couple of smaller parts from the end instead of a longer one, but in this case I may get a reprieve because the knot doesn't go all the way through the board. So I may be able to hide it on the back of a part where it won't be seen. Some knots can't be used though. This one doesn't go all the way through the board, but look at how the grain around it twists in different directions. You can see the effects of this by looking at the edge of the board. There's a slight bend right where the knot's located. Those crazy grain changes might look cool, but they make this part of the board unstable, especially because it's so close to an edge. It's better to cut it out than take the risk of the project part warping later. I like to use a long metal rule to lay out my parts instead of a measuring tape because it lays flat and I don't have to lock it to keep it from retracting as I would a tape. I'm also using a lumber crayon at the moment, but my tool of choice is usually a thick pencil lead like this one. It's really durable, much more durable than a regular pencil lead on a rough surface like this, but it'll leave a much crisper, easier to read mark than the lumber crayon. I'll put a link to it in the description below this video if you want to check it out. This board is a couple inches wider than the parts I intended to use it for. Rather than waste two inches of its width, I'm going to fit two rows of narrow parts on it instead. I'm adding about a half inch to the width of each part, so I'll have a little extra room for cutting and milling later. This board has distinctive colors that'll look great for the doors in this cabinet, but because it's so unique, I can't substitute a different board should I mess one of these doors up. So I'm reserving an extra piece from this area of the grain just in case I need it. I'd rather have extra waste than find myself with mismatched doors later. Sometimes on the most visible pieces of a project, Getting the right grain is more important than using a board most efficiently. I may even use a square to lay out a piece at an angle so the grain runs through it in just the right direction. I'll waste a lot of material when I cut this out with a bandsaw later, but details like this can make or break some projects. After the parts are all laid out, I cut my boards into smaller pieces using a chop saw and a bandsaw if I have to do any rip cuts. I don't do any of this on the table saw. It's just too dangerous to cut rough lumber on the table saw. I'm also not cutting on every line. I'm just reducing the overall lengths of the boards as much as I can. I want them close to two feet or so because that's an ideal length for jointing and planing. After I mill everything flat, then I can begin cutting out the individual parts. But even then, I leave them a little oversized until I need them for the project so I can make any adjustments I require for a perfect fit at that time. Wait, don't go yet. If you're new here, please subscribe and remember to ring the bell. I would really appreciate that. Give us a thumbs up, or better yet, leave us a comment. I always read them. And be sure to check out the latest issue of Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal. It's always packed with tips, tricks, and tutorials designed to make you a better woodworker.